Well, let's take our Bibles, please. Chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 tonight. We're getting close to the end of our study in the book of Ephesians. But I'm looking forward to the next one. And the book of Philippians is the book about joy, real joy. And Paul wrote that when he was in jail. Of course, he wrote Ephesians when he was in jail too. Uh, <coughs> and such wonderful truths that we'll find. Um, isn't the Bible a wonderful book? Amen. And you know, I was just thinking the other day, I'm so glad that I pastor a church that have, has an appetite for the Bible. Uh, sometimes, you know, because I go on and on and on, and you all are so patient and listen, and at least you act like you're enjoying it. <laughs> and some churches wouldn't be able to handle that, you know, there wouldn't be enough stories for them and, and, and uh, jokes and what have you, but I'm glad I pastor a church that uh, enjoy the Bible and have an appetite for Scripture because, I mean, really that's where it's at. And that's the, 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 the truths of Scripture are the things that anchor our lives. It's not the funny stories or the jokes. That doesn't count. doesn't mean a thing. Um, it's the Word of God. And I'm grateful for the privilege that I have of, of teaching and preaching. And I'm so grateful for um, what God has allowed me to, to, to do uh, with my life. But tonight we're going to look at verse 5 through verse 9. In verse 5 it says, Servants... Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive, he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, uh, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. And Lord, again, we thank you for the privilege we have. Thank you, Lord, for the good service this morning. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the soul that was saved, uh, who threw himself upon you. And Lord, thank you for the promise uh, that you caught him. And Lord, we're, we're so grateful tonight that when we turn to you in faith and trust, as imperfect as it is, and yet, Lord, when we turn in sincerity, believing upon you and depending and trusting on you, Lord, that you keep your promises and you save any that will come unto you like that. And we're grateful that we have a wonderful message to share with others. And we pray, Lord, for our visitors, the ones that are coming, uh, those who are still not saved, help us to see them saved, those who are saved and need to be baptized or discipled, help us, Lord, to continue uh, to work with them. May they continue to come. And uh, we pray that you'll bless us as we move forward here uh, at Calvary. We ask now, Lord, your blessings upon this message tonight. Help us, Lord, to be students of your word and to be uh, willing to receive this word tonight, that it might uh, change our lives, that we might glorify you with them. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the first things I realized when I got saved... And that's coming up on 36 years on the 29th of this month. Um, was that Christianity is not just something you do on Sundays. Um, I was just excited on Monday morning as it was. And I realized that if it was true on Sunday, it's also true on Monday, true Tuesday, true Wednesday. All the way through the whole week. Uh, not just one week or a little phase that you're going through, but it, it changes your life forever. And, and Christianity is for is for all time and it affects every part of our life our whole life has been changed because of christ and of course we mentioned this this morning but um the change in our life happens because of what christ has done for us and then the six chapters of ephesians the first three chapters speak about what god has done for us the blessings of god that we enjoy in christ jesus in fact let's just turn back there because it's been a long time since we saw this look at chapter one and verse three it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he speaks about the work of the Father, the work of the Son, the work of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1, what God has done for us. Chapter 2, he speaks about the change of life, the change uh, within us, the change of position that we have with Christ. Um, and then, of course, when he gets to chapter 4, he's now applying this to our lives. Now, uh, what we've seen in the last part of chapter 5 and also in the chapter 6 
is that God has a purpose and will for our lives. If you look at chapter 5 and verse 17, he says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so he's telling us what God's will is for our lives. Number one, he wants us to be sanctified. Verse 18, he says, And be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by God, be filled with God, be totally given over to God. That may, that's what sanctification is, to be separated from everything else and given over completely to God. And that's how you're filled with the Spirit, empty of self and filled with Him. And so God's will is that we be sanctified. Secondly, God's will is that we be spiritual. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart uh, to the Lord. And again, not a pseudo-spirituality, but something that is real, that we walk with God, that it affects the way we talk, the way we walk, uh, our songs, our singings, our, um, uh, we're to be spiritual. And then, we're to be, thirdly, we're to be submissive. In verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. You can only do that when you're submitted to him. And even the hard things, even the things we don't understand, we say, Lord, we don't know, but Lord, we submit ourselves to you, and we give you thanks for all things. And then verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. And really, we can't submit ourselves one to another until we're first of all submitted to God. Now, because of this sanctification and this spirituality and this submissiveness that we read in these verses, we see that it affects our lives in every aspect. And so first of all, it affects us at home. And so he talks about the wives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Then he speaks to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Then he speaks to the children, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. And so what we saw was that you really can't be a good wife unless you're a good Christian. And really, you can't be a good Christian unless you're a good wife. And you can't be a good Christian unless you're a good husband. And you can't be a good Christian unless you're a good child in the house. And you're, you're not, you can't be a good Christian if you're a terrible father, parent. He goes on to talk about parents, fathers, provoke, and ye fathers, provoke not your children on the wrath. And so our Christianity is not just for Sundays, it's for every day of the week. And it's not just here at church, it's, it's at home, at work, at, at everywhere we are. Now he goes on speaking about uh, our relationships at work in verse 5 where he talks about servants. Now really, in its original context here, um, it may be still be uh, being at home because there was a lot of servants who worked in homes. Okay, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. Um, but our Christianity affects our relationships at home. It affects our relationships at work. In verses five to eight, he speaks to employees or servants, um, and then in verse nine, he speaks to employers or masters. So let's look at the first section here, speaking about servants. In verse 5, he says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, when the Bible here speaks of servant master, he's speaking, of course, 2,000 years ago in the context of the Roman Empire. And the Roman world, for many, meant slavery. Uh, you will notice there in verse 8, the very last part, it speaks about whether he be bond or free. There's such a thing as a free man um, who was a citizen in the Roman Empire. There are also those who were, who were servants, who were slaves to their masters in the Roman Empire. Now, I want to just touch on this briefly. Slavery in ancient times was very common. Um, it was not based, however, upon uh, race or skin color or racism of any kind. It was primarily uh, economic, and it was also, uh, under some circumstances, a penalty for wrongdoing. Uh, also, if um, a, a city, for example, was uh, not paying their taxes, or there, were, uh, there was a war or something, uh, for example, when Nebuchadnezzar came against um, um, Tyre, uh, besieged the city, defeated the city, killed many people, and the rest of them were sold into slavery. And that was a punishment for you know, their wrongdoing. At least they, they lost the battle. Um, and so there were many reasons for slavery, but it wasn't a matter of, um, for the most part, um, of, of racism or something that we, when we think of slavery um, in, you know, in, in, in the last you know, two, three hundred years, um, it was a different thing altogether. Um, even Jews could sell themselves into servitude. Um, uh, we could call it slavery if you want, but it was basically to pay off their own debts 
and that they were still to be treated, though, with respect and dignity. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter 15. So many times these servants were servants because of something that they had done. Either they had gotten themselves into debt um, or they had done something wrong, and therefore their, um, their obligation, they were under uh, their personal uh, liberties had been removed to some extent. Um, and you know, that, that also carries over in the R day to, 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 in, in some ways. For example, I mean, we go to the jail on Tuesday night, um, and really, if you're a prisoner, that's a, that's a kind of slavery in the sense that um, your personal liberties have been removed and you're paying off a debt to society. And you know, you just can't open the door and walk out of the jail and go home. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. You have to stay there. You don't want to stay there, but you have to stay there. And you're separated from your wife and children and all the rest of it. And it's a terrible thing. Uh, but, and so in a, it's a sense of slavery. But it's something that they brought on themselves. It's a, debt, it's a debt that they brought on themselves that they're having to pay off a debt to society. Um, and the same is true when uh, if, if somebody, uh, if you or I get ourselves into debt, the Bible says that the, um, the borrower is serv servant to the lender. And you're going to have to work maybe jobs you don't want to work, and you're going to have to spend time uh, working that debt off, and you feel like you're a slave, and in, in, in many ways you are a slave, but it's, it's something that you've gotten yourself into, and you're trying to get yourself out of. And many times in the Bible, the, the master-servant relationship, that's what it was. Somebody had got themselves into debt, and they had to place themselves in, uh, in servitude in order, to, in order to pay off that debt that they owed. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 15, if you would look there, the Bible, now we're going to talk about slavery in just a moment in, in the way that we usually think of slavery. And let me say that that's completely different. And I'll, I'll show that to you in just a, a wee moment here. But in Deuteronomy chapter 15, the Bible does not um, espouse or condone slavery in the sense of the, that we would know it um, you know, in our world. And by the way, there's slavery is still going on around the world. There are Christians who are slaves right now in the Middle East. Um, who have been kidnapped, have been stolen. And it's through no fault of their own that they're slaves. But in Bible times, people got into debt and they gave themselves into the servitude. For, so look at Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 12. And in those cases, the Lord regulates it. Verse 12, it says, And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee. Now, he wasn't sold by somebody else. Uh, the Bible forbids that. He sold himself. In other words, he had debts that he had to pay, and in order to pay them off, he arranged this in the servitude, this indenture, where he would go into service for this particular master. And so, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years. Then in the seventh year, thou shalt let him go free from thee. In other words, um, six years was the, was the maximum that a person could serve under this arrangement. When it came to the seventh year, they had to be let free. And the seventh year was the Sabbath year. In fact, all their debts were settled on the seventh year, the sabbatical. Um, in verse 13, And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Now, you see, when you read this, there's no, I, there's no such thing as uh, not showing dignity or treating people like cattle. Um, and, and, and robbed them of human dignity. That was never, never, uh, never countenanced in Scripture. Uh, you don't send them away empty. You're going to send them with stuff. In verse 14, Thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give unto him, and thou shalt remember that thou, thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee, this thing today. And it shall be if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thine house, because he is well with it. Can you imagine this? Here's somebody who doesn't want to be released. He wants to stay with the master. That he loves the family. He loves serving in that home. Is that, is that possible? Well, the Bible says it is. And if that's the case, verse 17, then I shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear onto the door. And he shall be thy servant forever, and also unto thy maidservant uh, thou shalt do likewise. And this is called uh, him being a bond servant. And that's the term that Paul uses when he talks about Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, a doulos, a bond service of Jesus Christ. In other words, we're not serving the Lord because we're under obligation, because we have to. Um, in a way, we are indebted. 
because of all he's done for us. But that's not the motivation. We're, we, we love our master. We don't want to go free. We don't, we don't want to go anywhere else. We want to stay with Jesus. And so we're saying, Lord, here you go. Put a, pierce my ear. And they put a nail through a man's ear and nailed him to the door. And that was a sign that he was a servant in that house forever. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. And so what we see when God regulated this thing called servitude or uh, indentiture, slavery, if you want to put it like that, um, it, it involved respect and dignity. And it was something that the person had got himself into, something in a sense that he had control over, that he, he hired himself out. Now, when you go to work, you're doing the same thing in, in a way. Um, you're, 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 uh, you're saying, here's my time, and I'm devoting my time to my employer, and then he tells you what to do. Sometimes it's what you want to do, sometimes it's what you don't want to do, but you do it because you're employed by him, and then he's going to pay you wages in return. And so we're all servants, in a sense, in, in that regard. Now, the idea of slavery as we know it, is, is condemned in the Bible. Look over at Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16. And some of the, 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 great, the great men in the abolition movement, the abolition of slavery here in America uh, and other places around the world as well were Christian men. Um, uh, in England it was the same way. They, uh, Wilberforce and others and... Um, you know, uh, John Newton, who, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, he was a slave trader until he got saved, and then his whole life was completely changed around. Um, but the Bible speaks against that kind of slavery because what you're doing, it's not the individual's choice. Basically, that those individuals have been kidnapped. They have been stolen, and then they've been sold on, on a market like their cattle and their possessions of other men, and that is... Uh, spoken against in the scriptures. In Exodus 21, in verse number 16, the Bible says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. God had the death penalty for somebody who would steal another man, who would kidnap another man, and then sell him off as property. The Bible's against that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse number 10. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, now, you know, the black people of Africa, um, you know, for many, many years were, uh, were traded as slaves and many of them came here to the West Indies and also to America and were owned by uh, slave owners here in the United States and also in West Indies and other parts. But, you know, the people who, it was actually black people who round, it was, you know, the, the African tribes for many, many years were involved in, in uh, slavery of their own. One tribe would defeat another tribe and bring them into slavery. And it was, it was black people who uh, entrapped and kidnapped and stole other tribes and took them captive and sold them on to the slave traders. Uh, and so anybody who was involved in that is, is just plain wrong. It was wrong, it was wrong, it was wrong, and there was just absolutely no defense for it whatsoever. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, in verse number uh, 10, uh, Paul says... Look at verse, uh, verse 8. It says, but, if, but you know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. That's homosexuality. Then it says, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, right in the middle of verse 10, he has that word men stealers. And that is the idea of kidnapping and taking people against their will, putting your foot on their neck and subduing them, that they become property to be sold on. And the Bible puts them in the same category as murderers and whoremongers. It's offensive in the sight of God. Men are made in the image of God. And men are given liberty and free choice and free will. And those things are taken away from people when they're, when they're brought, in, brought, uh, brought into slavery. Now, so with, with that, you know, sort of broach tonight, uh, as we go back to Ephesians chapter 6, um, obviously, in the New Testament, uh, even the servant-master the, the servant -master relationship, the Bible doesn't come in to change that. Because, uh, again, it was, it was something that was part of paying off debt and that type of thing. Um, and even if people were taken by the Romans as slaves against their will, the Bible doesn't come in to try to change all of that. 
You see, the scriptures uh, have the, uh, our purpose is not to change the world. Uh, our, our purpose is to change hearts through the gospel. And when people are changed from the inside, then society does change. And that's not to say that we're not to uh, preach against injustice and so on, but our primary mission is to preach the gospel and to teach the word of God. And when people are changed from the inside out, then uh, their changes in society would take place. But in, in the context of uh, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, for our day today, uh, what this is basically speaking about is referring for us is that uh, to those who are employed by others. So the servants would be those who um, are the employees, those who have been uh, here serving others, who work at the uh, bequest of other, other people, who work under their supervision, who do what they're told to do. That's just being an employee. Uh, he's working for somebody else. And the masters here well, would be the employers. And so if we could use these verses in, a, in an application to our lives, that's what it would mean. It's speaking about work. Did you know that most of our Christianity is not lived inside these four walls right here? Most of, our, most of our lives are lived at home and at work. And church is way down the list. Four hours a week, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're at home and you're at work. You know, you spend more time in one day at work than you do in a whole week at church. And so Christianity has to affect where we are and who we are at home. It has to affect who we are at work because we spend an awful lot of time there. Now, for some people, work is a four-letter word. You say, well, it is a four-letter word. Well, it's a dirty word to some people. They don't like that word, work. But it's a good thing. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And... You know, uh, uh, you know, in our, our travels, and and you, you'll have the same experience where you're around this younger generation, and sometimes it's very troubling. Now, I, I thank God for Christian young people, and we've got some wonderful young people in our church, and I think they they know how to work. I know some of these young fellows; they know they they work all the time, and I'm grateful to see that. But it's very worrying uh, sometimes in the service industry when you get some of these young people and they're, they're serving you and they, they haven't the first clue and they don't want to know. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're bothering them. You know, they're on the phone or something. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of ethos that, that people have today. It's very worrying when you think of where the country and where society is going. But work is a very important um, thing to go on. And four, in verse number 11, it says, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without, and you have, may have, have lack of nothing. In other words, you have your needs um, met, um, not by walking around with your hand out, but uh, by working with your own hands. Look over at Second Thessalonians chapter 3, over the page in verse number 10. Chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, Paul said, This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Um, I mentioned this morning, there's a, a, a guy that comes here every a regular, every, you know, uh, four or five months, six months maybe. He probably does a round, you know, and he'll come very convincingly. He'll have papers and stuff. Oh, oh, I'm trying to get somewhere. Or, um, I'm, 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 employed, I'm, I'm starting work Monday, but I have this bill that needs to be paid. And it's, it's, it's a game, you know. And he does it. I've seen him several times, seen him over at Temple as well. And there's other churches and individuals, and he's well known actually in the area. And I think his wife's been pregnant for two and a half years. Um, and they need milk for the baby and, and, and all that and been pregnant for two and a half years, no baby. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's people who are tricksters and if they would use the same kind of energy to actually find a job, they would be far better off. But I don't know what it is, but in their mind it's a game or something. They want to basically rob other people to, to feed themselves. Now, the, the, the Bible gives us instruction. The way we feed ourselves is, is that we are to work. And... Um, let me just say that the, uh, it's something very important that, that people understand this in their youth. The Bible says in Lamentations 3.27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. It's good to 
do hard things even when you're a teenager, when you're young. I saw a thing on Facebook this week, you may have saw it, where it says it was a, a, a Navy uh, general or something. He was, uh, when he, he was recounting in the speech uh, when he was going through the, the, the Navy SEAL training and he talked about the sergeant coming in every morning at five o'clock or something. And first thing they had to do was to make their bed and they had to make it perfectly uh, square corners and fold it down, pillow in the middle. <clears throat> and so he was telling the recruits, he says, if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. And he went through how important it was to make your bed. Uh, and of course, the sense of discipline. But that's the first thing of many things you should be doing that day that you'll be successful at. And he says, if you go out and the whole day, there's a disaster. At least when you come back, your bed's made. But I thought about that this week. And I thought, if you want to change the world, get out of bed. Get out of bed. And so many young people, they just they don't want to work, they don't, uh, won't work, uh, can't work, won't work, and they're not interested in it. And what they fail to realize, it's so very, very important uh, as a matter of character that you need to get out of bed when you're supposed to get out of bed and get up and go to work. And if you, if you don't have a job, find a job. There's always something you can find. I was talking to somebody, uh, not here tonight, but in our church, he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now he has to go to work. I think he has to be at work at six. But he gets up at four because he does his journal. And he reads his Bible. And he prays. And he must, he must do that for a, a pretty long period of time before he goes to work. Now that's, that's character, friend. But, the, but young people, you can't drag them out of bed. You've got to get out of bed. Uh, we were just talking about that the other week. My, my dad used to go to work before I did. He had to be at work at half eight, eight thirty. I had to be at work at 9 o'clock. So when he went in the Belfast, I went with him. And he drove me out of bed <laughs> and into the car and uh, drove me in the Belfast and dropped me off at the sweetie shop. And I'd go in and get a, a, a pint of milk and a bar of chocolate. And there I would be off to, off to work. And uh, I'd, I'd be sitting there. And actually when I got saved, I used to bring my New Testament. And I started reading my, my New Testament in that time in the morning time. And then the clock in about quarter to nine, start working at nine o'clock. Um, uh, and I was 16 years old and young people need to understand it's important to get out of bed and to work work is a very important principle in the scriptures now as we look back at Ephesians chapter 6 notice what it says it's going to t tell us what we're to do and then how we're to do it in Ephesians 6 in verse 5 he says servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh now there are masters according to your flesh the masters according to the spirit is the Lord God is our master. He's our boss. But according to the flesh, he says, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, the word obedient is the same word we talked about before, hupo kuo. <clears throat> hupo meaning under kuo, akuo, which means to listen, where we get the word acoustics from. And it's the same word that is used in verse 1, children, obey your parents. Children, listen to your parents and do what they tell you to do. It's exactly the same word. Hupo means to go under, to submit yourself under as you listen. So be, being submissive as we listen to those who are our bosses. And what he tells us to do is uh, simply this, listen and obey. The most important thing you can do as an employee is simply do what your boss tells you to do. Do what you're told to do. That's rule that's the most important thing. If you're going in as an employee and you're telling your boss what he needs to be doing or what you need to be doing, you've got the wrong end of the stick. He's not your employer or your employee. You're his employee. And so obedience is very important. He says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. In other words, when they tell you to do something, then you're to do it. Uh, do what you're told to do. Now there's a sense, and this is a, like a yoke that the place is under, is this hupokio, listening under. We, we place ourselves under this yoke and we are going to then be directed. In other words, we're not a law under ourselves when we're being employed. You've entered into a contract. Uh, you're, you're yoked together with somebody else, maybe several people, but certainly with your boss. And he says you're to go this way, that's the way you're to go. If he says you're to go that way, then that's the way you're to go. And it may not be right, you may not think it's right, but as long as it's not in, in contradiction to the word of God or principles in, uh, of God, uh, where you obey God rather than men, but whatever he tells you to do, you're supposed to do that. One of the things I love about Jimmy, Jimmy is uh, an employee and he was also an employer. 
and Jamie's employing uh, in his work uh, many different people to do different jobs and sheetrocking and, and painting and all the rest of it. And when Jamie comes in here, uh, the one thing that sticks out about my relationship with him, he comes to me, and if I tell him to do something, he does it. He doesn't sit there and argue with me. Now, he's also, uh, to some extent, an advisor, and so I'm open to getting ideas from him as well. But if I ask him to do something, you know, if I say, Jimmy, that, that door needs... I don't have to ask him twice. He does it. Because he, as an employer, knows how important that is. Because he also has been on the other end of that. And when somebody's working for him and he says, I want you to paint the door, then he expects the door to get painted. It's the first thing that is important in working for an employer is you must do what they tell you to do. Don't argue. Just do it. That's what he's paying you to do. He's the one that's paying the bills. He's the one that's um, paying for your time. So if he asks you to do it, then, then just go ahead and do it. The second thing is, he says, Servants will be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. Now, fear and trembling has to do with our attitude, our attitude towards our responsibilities and also towards those to whom we are responsible. It's not just what we do. It's also the relationship we have with our employer. In other words, uh, the word fear, there's phobos, and it, phobos means fear. It means fear. Uh, if you look up in verse 33 of chapter 5, see that, uh, uh, and the wife see that she reverence, that's phobe. It's a connected word, and it has to do with respect. So, um, boss, you know, when the boss rings, it runs around the corner. You don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't make fun of the boss. You don't tell stories on the boss. If you do that, you know, walls have ears. It's going to come back. It's going to bite you. Don't do that. Um, the Bible says, fear him. In other words, reverence him. In other words, have respect. In other words, treat your work and treat your employer with the seriousness with which it deserves. And then trembling, and that's the Greek word tram, tremo, which means to tremble. It means to shake. And it's used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his own ability to meet all his obligations, but does his, his utmost to fulfill his duty. In other words, this work is really, really serious. And sometimes it's okay to be nervous in your work. Because that means that you're taking it with the seriousness that it deserves. And I, as I was thinking about this, when I come to preach, those are two words that I have. Now, you probably don't see it most of the time. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not as, as, as severe as others. But I come to preach in fear and trembling. And usually that's a good thing. If I come to the pulpit and, that, and that, uh, a little bit afraid, then um, usually that's not good. Some of the best messages I'll preach is when I'm actually trembling in my seat. Because that fear and the seriousness of what I'm doing, and when I'm coming to the pulpit, I really don't have it. I have an anxiety about uh, my own ability to meet that need, to rise to that occasion. And I know, I feel that many times that I know when I'm getting in the pulpit, I'm saying, God, please have mercy upon me. God, please help me to do my very best, Lord, I need your touch upon it because I've seen this thing fall on its face before when I'm trying to do my best without your hand upon me. And so I come to the pulpit in fear and trembling. But you know something? All of us, in all of our lines of work, whatever we might do, we should treat our, our job just like that. We should treat it with the utmost seriousness because your boss is treating it serious. And um, we need to, too. And the Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart. Now, the word singleness there means sincerity, no pretense, no hypocrisy. In other words, don't act like you're working. There's the boss. All right, get busy. Get busy quick. I can remember when we were mechanics. That was one of the things, you know. And, you know, every work has... Um, highs and lows, there's, there's intense periods and then there's periods of rest where you're not maybe you know, going as hard. And most bosses understand that. When, when he needs to ramp something up and he needs you on be, to be there and really going at it and, getting, and turning it out and working hard and spending maybe, maybe some extra time or overtime because he needs this done, maybe you should raise to that. And then when it slacks off, he, he's going to be okay with maybe you slacking off a little bit but um, because of, you have this, this, this waxing and, and waning. Uh, not everybody's going full tilt the whole time. 
Uh, but when he needs you, you better be there. And the singleness of heart, um, it's, it's not hypocrisy, like you're acting like you're, you're working. It's a sincere thing. You're d- really doing your best. And whatever he needs you to be, whatever he needs you to do, you're, you're not acting like you're working. You're not acting like you're behind it, but really you're not. You're slacking off. No, your heart's in it. And uh, he's glad he has you. And that's what a Christian uh, should be like at work. Um, that's the attitude that we have in singleness of, uh, of heart as unto Christ. You see, it's as unto the Lord. And by the way, when, when people are choosing their occupation, when they're choosing their life work, you need to put some thought into it. If you're going to spend your life doing stuff that you're not really into, but, but you're not going to be working because your heart's not in it, you've got to have passion about what you do with your life. Whatever it is, if it's being a motor mechanic or a, a joiner, you know, a, 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 um, whatever, a machinist, doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you've chosen to do, make sure it's something that you can be passionate about, that you enjoy doing, that you get up in the morning, you look forward to going to work. I used to enjoy waiting up in the morning. I used to love mechanic and, uh, and we'd have a job going on and, and I knew what I was going to be doing the next day. I got up in the morning. I was looking forward to going in to do that job. And, and when I was mechanic, time would just fly. Time would fly by. The day was over before you knew it. Because you were enjoying what you're doing. If you're sitting at a desk somewhere, you're doing something. And it's a drudgery. And you're just watching the clock every hour. And your heart's not in it. And I'm going to tell you something. Your boss is not going to be happy with you. Because what he's looking for is somebody who loves doing what he's You love doing what you're doing. You're going to do it well. You're going to enjoy it. And, you're, and everybody around you is going to enjoy it. And the boss is going to enjoy it. And so if you're doing something you just hate to do, you dread going into work, you need to start looking for, for a different job. And so it's important that you know, what do I enjoy doing? And, you know, if, if you do what you enjoy doing in life, then you, you never work a day in your life because it's just something you enjoy to do. I, I, I love, I can't believe you guys pay me. I love doing what I'm and I know there's, there's waxing and waning and there's, there's different times. Right now, the last way back, it's been just an intense study, study, study. I know there's other areas of my ministry that need to come up a little bit more. And we're, we're looking at that and uh, hopefully we'll be doing something more about that. But as, as far as visiting people and discipling and so on. But, um, but I love doing what I'm doing. I love it. absolutely love it. I'm born to do this. And you know something? You were born to do something. Amen. Find out what it is. And be enthusiastic about it. Because we're doing it as unto the Lord. It's really, you know, we want to please the boss. We want to make sure he's happy. But really more important than that is our master in heaven. That we're doing it for the Lord. And the Lord's looking while the master's, uh, well, our boss may be there, maybe not be there. But the Lord's looking all the time. And so we need to be consistent, be sincere, and, and do a good work for the Lord's sake. Because that's what's like. And that's not just a church. Because there's more time spent at home and at work. Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Do you want to know what the will of God is? Being a good employee. Serving the Lord. Not just, serve, not just uh, working when the boss is looking at you. Um, but doing the will of God from the heart. Again, putting your heart and soul into it. Verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. What happens if you are at work and you are more interested, um, say you're, you're more interested in something else? Well, maybe you need to look at something else as your occupation. Now, this is where it got to me, because when I got saved, I was more interested in gospel ministry than I was in my jobs. I lost interest in engines, engines and trucks and all the rest of it. Lost interest in all of that. And all I wanted to do listen to people and work when I should have been working. And that's not good either. Uh, we're, we're there to work, not to witness. Now, on your break time, you can witness all you want. Um, and, but if you're frustrated with, with the secular because your heart and mind is on ministry, or if you're distracted by the Lord's work, in other words, it's kind of like your, your secular work's holding you back and you'd rather be out doing something else. And uh, it's, it's, it's not just a fleeting thing, but it's a constant um, frustration, a, an, an interest, a desire for the Lord's work and gospel ministry. And the other stuff is paying the bills, but you're not really interested in it. You know, that might be a sign that God has something different for you. And maybe God has given you that desire for ministry. 
Before I became a Christian, I had absolutely no desire for anything connected with religion whatsoever. But see, when I got saved, you c- I couldn't get enough of it. Couldn't, couldn't get enough of church. Couldn't get enough of visitation. Couldn't get enough of, of just the whole thing. And I remember the frustration I had sitting in work, working on stuff, and just I was thinking about the Lord's work. And I wasn't thinking about uh, working as a diesel mechanic anymore. And so, and I made that decision. I was only saved two months, and I came forward and said, I'm giving my life to the Lord. Because I, I, I knew that frustration. I know Jamie's felt that frustration. He wanted, he, well, he's a good painter, and he's a great, he's a fantastic uh, sheet rocker, and he knows how to do that, and it's a good skill. And I think everybody should have something, a skill that they can do. It's great. But he couldn't wait to get rid of his tools. It's not because he, he hates rocking and painting, but his life is going in a different direction. God has called him the ministry, and he wants to give his life completely to that. And maybe God is speaking to your heart about that as well. And sometimes that's an indication, I think it is an indica- one of the indications that God is placing that desire. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Because that's not natural. <laughs> Unless there's something, you know, people are brought up in cr- preacher's homes or something, and they're, they're, they're looking to be a preacher as well. Uh, but, but for most of us, that's not a natural desire. Nobody says, well, yeah, I want to be a minister. I want to be a pastor. I want to be a missionary. I want to be... No, no, only God puts that in your heart. And so maybe God has put that in your heart. And if he has done, then he'll make a way for you to be able to do that. But all we should do for the Lord. Then look at verse number 8. He says, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, some of these people... Uh, maybe they were born slaves. But whether you're bond or free, the Lord, because you're serving him, you may be washing dishes, you may be cutting grass, but if you're doing that for the Lord and your heart's in it and you're, you're looking to the Lord and you're using your life and your time for him, doing the very best that you can, and you may not get paid right down here, but you know, that's one of the ways you're going to get paid right up there. When he talks about laying up treasures in heaven, it's not just giving the missions. It's how you live your life now and how you, you put the effort the, and the opportunities that God has given you to give yourself completely to him and to glorify him with your life and the Lord will reward you. Look over Colossians chapter 3 and this is the companion reading <clears throat> we like to come back to from time to time. He abbreviates it here in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, look in verse 17. He says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Okay, so that, whatever you do, at home, at work, your relationships with your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, uh, your, your, your employees, wherever it is, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children on, uh, to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Now watch, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. See that? Here's, here's maybe, um, maybe a servant in one of the homes um, in Asia Minor, and he's working, uh, maybe he may, may be working for an, un, an unsaved master, but he's a Christian and he's doing his very best, and he might even be mistreated, might not get the reward that he's supposed to, might not get the recognition that he's supposed to, but he's doing it unto the Lord. I'm going to tell you something, the Lord will not forget about it, and he will be rewarded in heaven. So we see, rewards is not just for missionaries and preachers and pastors, it's for everybody. And it's not just for the stuff you do here at the church. It's for what you do in the house. And mothers looking after babies. Guess what? If you do that in the right spirit as unto the Lord, you're getting rewards for that. And, and husbands are, work, you know, nine to five. If you're doing it for the Lord and you're trying to do what's right and, and, and be observant of the Lord's presence and all of that, you'll be rewarded for that. And so his instructions to serve, instructions to masters, you go back and look at verse number 9, just the one verse, and most of the verses, verse 5 to verse 8, speaks about servants, only one verse for masters, verse 9, and he says, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. Now the word master here is the Greek word kurios, which means lord, 
means lords. Um, there's another word that could, he could have used. It's the word despotes, where we get the word despot. And a despot is an, has absolute power and absolute dominion. But that's not the word that he uses. In other words, you employers, don't be acting like a despot. Don't be acting like a, a tyrant. And I, you know, I've been around bosses that thought that they were despots, that they thought that they owned you, and, uh, and, they, and they made you feel that way. That's not the word to choose. The word is uh, curios. In other words, uh, there's a certain amount of control, responsibility that they have, absolutely, uh, but not absolute control. They're not to be despots. Employers are not to be mean ogres, lording it over their employees and making their life um, uh, difficult for them. And he says, uh, ye masters, do the same things unto them. Now he talked about, in verse 8, uh, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same. So he's speaking about these employees doing good to their employers. Now they're doing ultimately for the Lord. But there's nothing wrong with trying to please your boss. Now he talks about men pleasers. If you're only doing it for your boss, okay, then if he's not looking, then you can do whatever you want. But the Lord, we're, primarily we're trying to please the Lord. But in doing that, there's nothing wrong with pleasing the boss and meeting his requirements. Um, and so the employees are to do good to their masters, to be faithful to their masters, to be honest with their masters. And then he says, ye masters, do the same things unto them. In other words, as your employees are doing good to you, then you reflect that. You do good to your employers. Amen. You know, the best asset a company has, it's not its buildings or its machines or the money in the bank. The best asset a company has is its people. And, you know, CEOs understand this. Uh, the, you know, the, um, the companies that really are excelling here at the top of the game understand that people are their... Are their overboard, not overboard, but they, they really address those issues, uh, issues of respect, um, issues of um, listening to their employees, okay? Um, and if... You know, if you have a happy employee, if you have a, 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 an employee that you respect, if you respect the employee and you're listening to him, legitimate concerns, and you address those concerns, therefore showing respect to that employee, he's going to respect you. And I'll tell you what, if he respects you, he'll be loyal to you. If he thinks that you're, he's trying to get around, he's going to try to pull the wheel over your eyes, that you don't like him, he doesn't like you, listen, you'll lose money. Because they're, the, they're on the ground floor. They, they know how the thing works. They know how to steal stuff. They know how to uh, loaf on the job and uh, the employers not know anything about it. But if you have somebody's heart and, and the employee respects the employer and he's happy where he works and he's loyal to his employer, that person will work his best and the company will be at its best because the people will be at their best. And so an employer should understand it's important the relationship he has with his employees, that they're not just, um, you know, animals to be worked. They're people to be respect respected. And so he's saying, they're doing good to you. You do good to them. Do the same things unto them. You do good to them as they're doing good to you. Then he says, forbearing, threatening. The word threatening there means to menace. Um, don't be overbearing. Don't be threatening. Don't be menacing. Uh, you know, one more, like, one more you're gone. Uh, you're, you're going to get fired. Uh, were you threatening them all the time? You better, it's going to happen, you know. And that's not the way. That's that's driving people with a stick. And the car is much better, you know. And so, if you, if you have somebody's respect and somebody's heart and somebody's loyalty, and you go and talk to that person, they'll they'll break their arms and try and help you. They'll work themselves to death because they they want to they, they want to do what's right. But if you're there with a big stick trying to drive them, they'll not, they'll not go. Don't threaten them. Don't menace them. Don't be overbearing. Knowing, he says in verse 9, that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respective persons with him. So we also, uh, employers also have a master in heaven, and he's even on everything. He's, he's impartial. He's without respective persons. He's not going to be against somebody because there's no, they're a servant and before you because you're a master. No, he's, listen, it's even with the Lord. He calls a spade a spade. If he's wrong, he's wrong. If he's right, he's right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And the Lord, he sees everything. And so 
uh, we've got to understand that we are not a law. Uh, speaking of, of uh, employers, we're not a law. Uh, an employer is not a law unto himself, but he also has a master in heaven who's, that he has to obey. And of course, speaking about Christian masters. And so what he's saying is this, treat others as you would like to be treated. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're an employee, um, you know, treat the employer as if you like your employees to treat you. If you're, if you're a, a, an employer, then you treat your employees the way you would want to be treated if you were standing in their shoes. And if we, if we follow those rules, I think a lot of times uh, it, it makes things go the way they're supposed to. Forgive others as you would like to be forgiven. Is not what the Lord's Prayer is? Forgive us our debts as, as, as we forgive our debtors. Lord, you forgive me the way I forgive other people. And it's, it's looking on the things of others and reward others as you would like to be rewarded. How do you treat the When you go out to eat and you're sitting at the table and maybe something goes wrong, food or the food is cold or there's a hair in my soup or something like that. How do you treat the waitress? When it comes time to tip the waitress, do you get the, you know, you're looking for 8% or something, you know? Or maybe just put a dollar on the table. And, uh, um, this was a, an article in USA Today uh, a while ago. Uh, they interviewed S Steve Odlin, who is uh, the CEO of Office Depot. And they, he said concerning the CEOs, when they're, when they're hiring their staff and their managerial staff especially, they use what they call the waiter rule. And the waiter rule is, is this. How these prospective candidates for the company treat the CEO says absolutely nothing. It doesn't mean a thing to them. They can, hire, you know, they can be humble and be very polite to the CEO. Well, that's expected because they're going to be your boss. But when they take these people out to eat, they're watching very carefully how they treat the people under them. So how do they talk to the waiter or the waitress? How do they tip them? Are they kind? What if something goes wrong? How do they react to that? And what they say is how they treat the waiter is like a magical window into the soul. And if that, if that job is mean to the waitress, is stingy with the waiter, if he's looking to, you know, I could buy this place and, you know, even when they're working with CEOs, I could buy this company and you'd be the first to be fired. When you have that sort of attitude, they move away completely. That guy doesn't get the job. The waiter room. I think it's very important. And I think it's important for us as well as Christians. You know, and some of us have been there and been mistreated. And so all of us, in a sense, are employers. When we go out to eat and somebody's waiting on us, we need to be respectful, we need to be kind, we need to be generous when it comes to the tip. <clears throat> um, because that's what it means right here. Treat others the way you And so we do not turn our Christianity off when we clock in on Monday morning. We're to be a Christian 24-7, seven, seven days a week. 365 days a year, no matter where we're Most of the time, we live our lives at home and at work, not at church. And if all our Christianity is right here, and we can be really good Christians for four hours a week, but if we're not good Christians out there, then we're not really being sanctified, we're not being spiritual, we're not being submissive to God, we're not following His will. We're doing the will of God from the heart, both for the employee and the employer, We've got to do what he tells us to do right here. Lord, we love you because of Okay, then be a good person at work. Be a good Christian at work. That's where your testimony is. Your Christianity is on display in the real world at work. Your testimony is at stake. Your rewards in heaven are at stake. How you live your life as a Christian. And can I just say as we close, let people know that you're a Christian at work verbally and also and you know a lot of times when you when you come out and you let people know you're a christian then you know that people know you're saved and you can't get away with anything and it keeps you on your toes there was a brethren man in belfast his name was jim muir and uh evangelist uh, uh bobby um bates um would tell the story when he was he went into this work where uh, jim muir worked and jim muir was up on this big machine 
and Bobby Bates was being brought in and shown around the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the workshop. And, and uh, Jim Muir was up on this big machine, and he jumped down and he said, Hello, I'm Jim Muir, and I'm a Christian. Amen. That's how he was introduced. <laughs> it scared the life out of the guy. You know, he said, Hello, I'm Jim. That's how I met. You know, I was, when I got saved, and I went back into the work, and I started witnessing the people, and I had people coming out of the work, we'd work, Oh, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been, I said, What? I've worked here for two years. I didn't know you were a Christian. I was so naive, you know. But they started owning up that they were Christian. I had no idea that they were seeing. And they didn't act like they were saved, by the way, before they, because I was witnessing to them and trying to get them saved. And they said, well, actually, I am a Christian. I am saved. Everybody in your work should know that you're saved. Yeah. Amen. That's right. And then you've got to live up to them and be a good testimony. Because you spend a whole lot of time at work. And you know something? You're going to have a whole lot of opportunities to be a witness at work. Where I, I wouldn't get Everybody else in here wouldn't get on, your, but you're there, and you are a missionary in that place where you work. I thank God. It was through work that I got the gospel, and you've heard my testimony many times, I'm sure. But when I came into work that morning, and Wesley, an apprentice, witnessed to me, and then he was joined with another guy, and for six, six or seven weeks, those guys witnessed to me every break time, coming to me with corner me, and, and I was a willing participant. I didn't want to get saved, but I was listening. I knew there was, I was seeking. And they took the opportunity to persuade me, and I thank God that they did. I thank God that I was employed at Charles, Charles Hurst Commercials Limited on the Raven Hill Road in Belfast because it was there that I heard the gospel and through the witnesses of those two young fellows that I got saved. Amen. And maybe there's some young fella in your place that God would open the door and you would say a word and witness to them and persuade them. And, and you know, be sensitive. Some people don't want to be persuaded. But if, but if they're open to it, then take every opportunity and be a witness. And maybe somebody in your place of work would get saved because of your witness. Be a Christian at work as well as a Christian at church. Let's pray together for prayer. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, help us all feel in many ways. We've heard a, a word of encouragement tonight, a word of challenge. We pray that you'd help us, Lord, uh, to own our Christianity, not just here at Calvary Baptist Church, but, Lord, where we clock in in the morning, when we have people around us that are watching us, Lord, may, may they not see us lose our temper. Lord, may they not see us in a fight with somebody. May they not see us flustered. But, Lord, give us the peace of God at work. Help us to have a good testimony. Open up doors of witness for us. And, Lord, help us to be a Christian at work. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.